This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get free access to Nebula, the streaming platform built by all of your favorite YouTubers, when you sign up at CuriosityStream at the link below. See, when I grew up, I always thought the way it worked is Walt Disney is sitting in bed and he sits up and he goes, Dumbo. And they just do it. And he goes to work and he has the whole film in his head. In right. the opening shot, we right. see a stork and he flies down. And so that was what I seriously think in the back of my head. I believe that's how it worked. Right. So I was waiting for John to come in and tell us what are we going to do. And instead, he would come in and go, Well, what do you think, guys? And I was like, What? This doesn't, how? What? As it turns out, of course, John's enormously clever because instead of just his brain, which is already pretty great, he gets all these other brains. And if you steer people the right way, you get all the ideas from a great community of people. Well, that was one of the great pleasures for me in working on Toy Story and the success of Toy Story was that I got to meet these heroes of mine like Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. And I struck, struck up a, a really great friendship with Joe, Joe Grant, right. as you mentioned, um, who I talked a lot about, like, what was it like doing this? And what were you thinking on, you know, Dumbo and, and so on? And uh, one thing he always, uh, more than once would mention is, what are you giving the audience to take home? Okay, there's all the fun of bright colors and movement, but what the next day or in two months are people gonna think about that is in your film? And usually that comes down to a, a, a life truth, something that you've experienced in your own life, mm -hmm. or something that is really emotional. Those are the things that really mean something to you. So on every film that I've worked on, you know, we're always digging for something like that, something that's really gonna matter to people. What happened was, okay, I, I love work. You know, as soon as I got to Pixar, I would just stay there all day and all night. My wife, when we first got married, would we'd eat dinner and then she'd come and play video games and fall asleep until I would wake her up at two in the morning when I was done animating and we'd go home and I'd go back to work because wow. I just couldn't get enough. <laughs> and then we had a kid. And um, so Monsters started at about the same time the kid did. And, uh, <laughs> and as I was working on the film, I was like, this is great. And then my wife would say, he smiled for the first time. And you missed it, because you're at work. And I was like, well, how do I make this go? Because I want to be in both places, but I can't. And that really is what became the story, the sort of emotional backbone of, of Monsters. Uh, a Sully, who's a monster who loves his job, suddenly gets this kid, which is at first scary and weird, which is true of real kids. Uh, <laughs> and, and then he grows to care for her more than he does the job. And so, you know, it's that impossible struggle with no answer that I think makes for good stories. Uh, this one actually started from a story about two princes who lived in a floating city <laughs> on an alien planet. Believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting at first. And then it w went to this weird place of like, who do I identify with yeah. here? I don't understand. And, and, and after a while, I realized, okay, we're getting nowhere and I've got to get something that people can relate to. Right. So we stripped away everything but the essential elements of that story, which to me, I'm not an extrovert. So nobody told me that as a director, all you do is go around and talk to people all day. <laughs> And so uh, most of the time at the end of Monsters, I would want to crawl into my desk right. and just kind of rock in a fetal position for a while. And so the idea of escaping, of floating away, sounded really appealing. And so that's what the floating city was. Right. And we said, well, what if we make it a floating house? And well, it shouldn't just be floating. It should have some sort of logic, maybe balloons. Yeah, okay. And so we came up with this visual and it was really intriguing and I couldn't get it out of my head. And then we worked backwards from there to figure out why is this guy floating his house? Well, who is he? Yeah. Why is he floating? Why didn't he just take the train or something? <laughs> there must be a really good reason he's floating his house and where is he going?
my daughter actually did the voice of young Ellie at the very beginning of Up, yeah, yeah. and she was a lot like that kid in that movie. Um, and then, yeah, when she got to be 11, she was much more quiet and, and changed a lot, you know? Um, and we were like, what's going on inside of her head? And then I was thinking, well, let's find out. It was a film that we started to tell from the kid's point of view, and then as Ronnie Del Carmen, who's uh, the co-director on the film, realized, wait a minute, we're telling our story as parents yeah. watching the kid. And so that central relationship is what is thrown into question, Joy and her kid. And I mean, I think it, it refers back to what you were talking about earlier, that the stuff, the sticky content, is yeah. the stuff that comes from an emotional moment or an emotional epiphany or something that, that may be only really known to you, but it comes through in the story somehow. Yeah, and it's weird, like, as other people have noticed this too, that the more particular and specific you are in the storytelling, the more generally it applies. Right. If you try to generalize, then nobody really gets anything. But if you're very specific and, and personal about it, um, it seems to resonate more. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you probably know that I'm always trying to strike a balance in the topics that I choose. Film history is such a fascinating and rich subject full of new avenues to always discover. But one of the problems with that is that YouTube's algorithms tend to favor videos that only talk about the most popular films being released. And that's why I want to tell you about Nebula, a subscription-based streaming platform developed by and featuring creators like myself. It's a place where we can experiment with different kinds of content without the headaches of demonetization and the effects of the YouTube algorithm. It's a place where you can not only watch my videos ad-free, but it's a place where you can also check out some really incredible original content. But it gets even better. I'm sure you've heard of CuriosityStream, but if you haven't, they are a wonderful home to thousands of top quality documentaries and non-fiction shows on a wide variety of subjects, like this fascinating feature-length documentary right here about one of my very favorite artists, Urge, the writer and illustrator of the classic Tintin comics. Now, the good folks at CuriosityStream have partnered with Nebula to create a bundle. So if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. Two streaming services for the price of one. So much amazing content to dive into, and by signing up, you'll be supporting independent creators like myself. So head over to the link in the description to sign up today. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.